Jesus. Lord, we welcome you into our hearts. We welcome you into our presence, Father. We thank you, dear Lord. Hallelujah. For as we come together, for no other reason but to lift up your name, Father God. Let us have one heart and be on one mind and one accord in this place. For we gather together, not for ourselves, Father God, but only for you. Hmm. Jesus, we worship you. We magnify you. We glorify you. Ah, we welcome you, Jesus. Come into us. This service right now. Hallelujah. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this sanctuary on today. Hallelujah. Dear Lord, as, as we just take time, even right now, to just exhale. Hallelujah. And all of our burdens that we carry throughout this week. And everything that tried to come against us. When we exhale, we just give it all over to you. Because this is your place. This is your house. This is where we gather, dear Lord. Hallelujah. Not only to lift you up, but to strengthen one another, Father God, with your word, with your love, with your wisdom. We honor you on today and on every day. And we just say thank you. Do it for the Holy Ghost, y'all. Breathe in Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And lay it all down. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the first fellowship of Friday on today. That is myself, Evangelist Asia, <laughs> Sister Miss Carlton, and the psalmist over there, Jamila Martin. But we're standing in for Pastor Leslie in her absence. And we just ask the Lord to know the words to say as she has said. And I'm asking God to anoint your ears. Hallelujah. So it'll be beautiful. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. All right. So we're going to just start it off. <laughs> when the Spirit of the Lord fell on me, I said, Thus saith the Lord. When the Spirit of the Lord fell on me, I said, Thus saith the Lord. When the Spirit of the Spirit of the Lord fell on me, I said, Thus saith the Lord. When the Spirit of the Lord fell on me, I said, Thus saith the Lord. I danced, I danced, I danced, I danced, I danced, I danced. 
Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I told Satan, get thee behind. Joy today is mine. Can't nobody do me like That's why we can say, we can say victory. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind, cause Victory today is 
hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Put your hands together as we welcome someone who's going to bring us the welcome on this morning. Do we have someone designated? Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day to worship the Lord on the Lord's day in the Lord's house. We are so delighted to have our visitors here with us this morning, our church family, and those of you who are visiting with us on social media. We pray that you will enjoy the service, be encouraged, and have a blessed week. Thank you. We love you. And for the prayer. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the time that we will go into the Lord with prayer. We are going to pray for our sick and our shut in. And also pray for this world, Lord. And pray for what's going on with this Delta variant. Father God, so let us close our eyes and bow our heads. Oh, precious Lord, our Father, we come to you today to say thank you for a wonderful day. Father God, you know what's going on around this world. You know what's going around, what's going around in the city. Father God, we come to you to ask you and to say thank you for all that you do. Lord, you know when we woke up this morning how our day is going to be and how we how we're going to receive you today. Father God, we ask you to be with those that are sick and shut in, Father God. Bless them, guide them, and, and lead them. We know that you have that healing power, that you would take care of them. And if they just only call on your name, have faith and trust in you, everything would be all right. Lord, Lord, some students are going to school tomorrow. And Father God, put your healing arms around them, wrap around them. Wrap your arms around the parents that are so concerned, Father God, that they don't know if their child might be in contact with somebody with this virus, Lord. But we ask you to just be with them, guide them, lead them, and strengthen them, Father God. Lord, it's getting, it's getting bad. But Father God, you said we put our faith and trust in you. Everything will be all right. Lord, you're a good God. You're a great God. Lord, from the sole of our head to the bottom of our feet, you know, every hair that we have, the number of hairs that we have on our head. And Lord, we know that you are um, sovereign God, and you're going to take care of us. So we just ask you, Father God, today and for the rest of the week, Lord, just protect us, wrap your arms around us, be with those that are sick, be with those that are grieving, Father God, and be with this world in the community. So, Father God, we ask this in your mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's such an awesome privilege to be here in the house of the Lord one more time today. Amen. Praise God. I am so excited about seeing all of you today. Amen. That means God has been answering my prayers all week long, that he keep you, protect you, provide, and sustain you. And seeing you here is proof positive that God is in control, is on top of the world. Amen. I see some guests here. Amen. A -a Amen. I don't know why they thought they were going to sit on the front row and I wasn't going to notice that they guests. Amen. Usually my guests hide in the back, but no, they sit on the front row uh, like I'm not going to see them. Amen. Would you like to introduce yourselves to us so that we can love on you properly? Okay. 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 Miriam Allen and Miriam Davis. I guess, I guess the last name is not Davis anymore. It's Miriam, huh? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Go ahead, brother. It's all right. You may be seated. It's so good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Amen. Now, let me warn you. They're going to come. My, my members are going to come hug on you, all right? They're going to love on you. Amen. Don't take it the wrong way. That's because their pastor is a hugger and a lover. All right. And so they are just doing what I've asked them to do, which is to make all our guests feel at home so that so when you want to come back, you're not a guest anymore. You you cousin. Amen. Amen. You you here to visit and, and worship God with us. Amen. Again, thank you uh, for joining us this morning, uh, as well as everyone on the World Wide Web. You know, we're streaming our services. And so we have people watching that we don't have a clue as a who they are, but we want them to know that we appreciate you. Amen. We know you didn't have to spend your time watching us, and we pray that God will continue to bless you, amen, wherever you are, and help you through whatever it is you're dealing with. Amen. Amen. Let me uh, uh, get to what, I, my, what my purpose of being up here is today. I'm not a stand-up comedian, amen, or anything like that. I do try to tell jokes from time to time, but my job is to declare the word. And there is a word this morning from the Lord God Almighty. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the first chapter of Mark? Amen. A amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the 32nd through the 34th verses. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 32 through 34. Amen. If you can stand, have the ability to stand, we ask that you stand during the reading of the word. Amen. Praise God. The New Revised Standard Version of the scripture reads as follows. That evening at sunset, the people of Capernaum brought to Jesus all persons who were sick or possessed of demons and the whole city was gathered around the door and Jesus cured uh, amen praise God many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he would not permit permit the demons to speak because they knew him amen thus far the word of god the title of our uh our title of our sermon this morning amen getting time tied you can be seated amen praise god the title of our sermon this morning is freedom givers a critical examination of how christ jesus frees persons from living subjugated and oppressed lives part three freedom givers a critical examination of how christ jesus frees persons from living subjugated and oppressed lives part three Amen. Amen. You know, I shared with you last week at the end of last week's sermon that my intention was to deal with Mark chapter 1 uh, in its entirety, it, with this pericope in its entirety. It, it, it really begins with Jesus entering the synagogue on the Sabbath in Capernaum, and it ends on the doorsteps of Saint P, uh, uh, Simon Peter, he is Saint Peter, Simon Peter's uh, house. Amen. Uh, and my intention was to plow through it, to run through it, to give you uh, the points God wanted me to give you, and to move on 
to the next scripture, but God has a way of saying, I need you to slow down. I need you to settle down for a second, and I need you to spend more time where you are. Amen. It's like the old folks used to say, amen. Uh, uh, my brother and I, they would have fried chicken, and we would eat drumsticks and the thighs, but we wouldn't eat the gristle and the stuff coming up. And the old people used to say, uh-uh, there's more meat on that bone. For you to for you to get off of there, and we 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 couldn't see it because all we saw was the grizzle. But to my aunt and uncle, my grandmother, that was meat. Amen. It was just as uh, edible, just as delicious as the meat that we thought we had eaten. Amen. So God says to me, or and said to me, "There's more meat on this bone, and I need you to slow down, to break the scripture up into two parts." And let me do what I am going to do. Amen. Amen. So praise God. I said, amen, God, let's do it. In fact, God shared with me uh, uh, that many times, amen, uh, that the lessons that he most wants us to learn are learned on the journey. We, we, we think the lessons are learned at the end point. They're learned on the journey. The end point is reaching the final destination where God wants you to be. But learning occurs on the journey because on the journey you experience certain things. And many times on your journeys, you experience things that you've never experienced before. And so by the time you get to the end point, you have the reference point. You have the understanding. You have the truth. You have the facts. You have the experience upon which then to teach, to preach, to do whatever God has called you to do. But in the course, there's some things that happen along the journey and along the journey of getting where we want to go here in this sermon series about be, being freedom givers, being persons that God uses to help other people uh, gain freedom from the subjugation and the oppression they experience in their lives. God says, let's chew on this for a second. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Peter... Simon Peter's mother-in-law has been healed. She had a fever. Amen. Amen. If you recall, amen, praise God. Having a fever is not the sickness. The fever is your body fighting the sickness. It is your body heating up to a certain temperature in the attempt to kill the virus or the bacteria or the germs or the illness or the sickness in your body. The problem is this is antiquity. Because this is antiquity, there is no CVS that persons can go to. There's no Walgreens, 24-hour Walgreens. There's no uh, local grocery store that has a pharmacy in it. There's, you, you can't go to urgent care or the clinic like you normally would, get a prescription, go home, feel better in the day. When persons got sick during this time, it was serious. And it clearly, the, the body's ability to heal itself, the body's ability to address the sickness that his mother-in-law was feeling w was not easily overcome. In fact, she had become bedridden and had been there for a while. It took Jesus coming in, helping her, healing her, so that she's able to get up and serve others. Now, I know that when we read Mark chapter 1, it says she got up and began serving them. And, and, and I know our, 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 our tendency is to think she got up and she began preparing food, serving food. But I think when we minimize this sister's uh, ministry to simply uh, serving as a waitress or as a, 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 a chef in a kitchen, we minimize what, what, what God is doing in this woman's life. This woman had been subjugated and, and oppressed for a period of time, and now in her freedom, she is serving God. Now, here's the thing. We make the assumption that she's serving him food, but notice uh, Mark chapter 1 does not tell us that she's serving food. She just says she begins serving God, serving them. And so my sanctified imagination has me believing that this sister wasn't just uh, 
uh, uh, uh, in the kitchen. This sister was where Jesus was. Amen. That 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 she's there waiting on him hand and foot. If Jesus uh, is preaching or he's teaching at the moment, there she is with his towel to give it to him so he can dab his forehead. If he's going to declare um, a specific word, there she is with her tablet or her cell phone with the Bible app already open so she could just pass it to Jesus and Jesus could then read the, the scripture to the people. She's there serving him. Now in the midst of serving him, something happens. That's where we are today. In the midst of serving him, there be, there's a knock at the door. Now any of us that have a home know that it's not unusual to occasionally get a knock on the door. Amen. The people that are selling the magazines, the kids with their fundraisers, with the chocolate, I love seeing them. Amen. Because they got the good chocolate. I, mean, I, I, mean, I ain't going to lie to you. I, I, I wonder where the other 300 and uh, some days of the year are that is they got the chocolate with the big almonds, the big pecans, and all, and the candy bars. Amen. I look forward to seeing them. But we we get the knocks on the door. Occasionally, we'll get a Jehovah Witness or someone knocking on your door. It's not unusual to have someone knocking on our door. And at uh, this house that Jesus is staying at, at Simon Peter's house, someone knocked on the door. And when Simon Peter or his servant went to open the door, what they noticed, it wasn't just one person outside side of their door it was a bunch of folks in fact it was folks as far as the eye can see that people uh, all shapes sizes and color were outside the door and they all had their proverbial hand out asking where is Jesus we heard that Jesus uh, exercised a demon from the man in the synagogue today and hearing that, we want to know if he would do that for us. My mama's friend's uncle, cousin, niece's daughter has a demon too. Will he bless them? Not only, it, not only will he bless them with exercising demons, but my friend over here is suffering from a medical condition. It has left that person partially paralyzed, has left that person unable to speak, has left that person with poor vision. Can he do it? The people are, have a mass at the doorway, and they are wanting Jesus to do for them what he's done for the man in the synagogue and Simon Peter's mother-in-law in his house. That's where we are. And what we see is that when uh, the people come and they request Jesus being as good as he is, ministers to them. He blesses them with what it is that uh, they are looking for, that they are seeking from him. Amen. Um, there's some things, though, when we look at this scripture, amen, it's three verses. It does not seem all that particular. It, it, it's not a great set of verses where it shows this story of Jesus interacting with some character and having a great discussion. It just talks about people from the city coming to Jesus, Jesus healing them. Amen. And our tendency, which was my tendency when I first read this, was to speed through that. But we got to be careful of speeding through things. That mo most of God's best revelations come with something that doesn't look like there's any revelation to be gained from it. And so when we look at that, there's some points that God wants us to walk through this morning. Amen. Our first point is we don't have to worry about how we're going to spread the good news. It will do that on its own. We don't have to worry about how we spread the good news. It will do that on its own. Um, I have to be honest with you uh, about something. When I came into the pastoral ministry, all right, marketing was, is a big thing for many churches. Amen. Uh, they have you sign up for the email blasts where they send you emails about what's going on at their churches. You see some churches running commercials. 
And if they're not running commercials, they are posting on Facebook and social media what we call memes, M-E-M-E-S. I was, funny thing, when they first came out, I was called memes, amen. And so, you know, my daughter has said, no, daddy, they're called memes, not memes, all right, amen, amen. But these, in fact, so it, th these are I saw persons doing, I saw how effective they were. I realized that in ministry, we were going to need that too. Amen. Amen. Uh, so with my first pastorate, we started learning how to, to create our own memes. And, and, and the funny thing, we did that out of necessity because when I called a couple graphic designers to ask them to do me, uh, create some memes for me, they each wanted to charge me $500 a piece per so for a brand new ministry with no money, we couldn't afford it. And you know the old saying that necessity is the mother of all inventions. I almost think that you need to have a need first before you can invent something because without it, you don't know what you need to invent. And so what happened, I, I would take what I saw someone else uh, 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 memes and advertisement, and I would try to create my own. And it's like drawing, amen. You can look at Picasso's and Michelangelo's and Romero Bearding's uh, paintings, amen. And you can try it, but when you first start, it's going to be stick figures. In fact, when I look back on the very first set of me advertising memes, I, I cringe uh, about how bad they look, amen, but I realized it's in the process as we are working on that, I realized how to create these memes that look professional, that look like we paid $500 a pop. In fact, if you go to our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our Instagram page, you're going to see our page littered with advertisement memes. Uh, yours truly created those. And I know that God has brought me to a place in, in creating them because I've had other pastors and other ministries ask me, where are you getting your memes from? Who's creating them? And when I share that I am, they're like, how do you have time? I said, well, God has, has grown me to the point that I can pretty much create a meme in about 45 minutes. If you leave me alone, I can get you one in 45 minutes. And so I was always working with this understanding under this impression that we have to market ourselves. We have to advertise ourselves. If the church is going to make a dent in this world that we live in, we've got to be at the forefront of advertising. Amen. And I do think that the church should advertise. I do think the church should make known what God is doing. But God in this scripture spoke to me today, or spoke to me this week, and he said, not all, you don't have to advertise all the time. He said, sometimes, many times, the gospel itself will do everything that you need it to do. And I said to God, how is that possible if no one is running a commercial, if no one is posting an advertisement meme on their social media? How does that happen? God said, look at the scripture. This is why we couldn't split it up. The scripture has to be together. Amen. Uh, the, the, when we look back, the thing that caught everyone's attention was that Jesus exercised the demon from the man in the temple. The town doesn't know about Peter, Peter's uh, mother-in-law yet, Simon Peter's mother-in-law. They know about the exorcism. Now, if you're paying attention to the scripture, this happens all within a matter of hours. So imagine, th this. we're here right now, amen, praise God, I'm going to mess with her since she's sitting on the front row, amen. Uh, hey, so, so, so Ramona's like, not me, yes you, amen, praise God, a amen. Let's say Sister Ramona in her, we have a testimony service this morning, in her testimony she says, well, you know, I have, I suffer from rheumatism or, and, and, and rheumatoid arthritis and gout, and it really hurts and it's hard for me to get up and move just standing right now, her and God speaks to me and says, go over there, lay your hands on her and declare my will over her life. So I go and I lay my hands on her and I declare in the name of Jesus, you are healed. That rheumatism and rheumatoid arthritis and gout will not harm you or hurt you or cause you pain and suffering ever again. And all of a sudden she feels healing in her body. Come on, tell the truth. That, that is, that'll be so different from what we normally have that every one of us would walk out of this church talking about what they saw. We, many of us would be questioning, but we'd still be talking about it. 
And if we wouldn't just be talking to one another as we're going to the parking lot, we would be on the phone saying, you're not going to believe what happened here in church today. And someone listening to you, even if you don't believe it, is going to say, I have nothing else to risk than to come to First Fellowship Charlotte. I need to be there next time Pastor Al is preaching because I don't know if Pastor God will call Pastor Al to do for me what he did for the woman at his church. But I want to make sure I'm there so if the presence of God falls on Pastor Al, I may be the next person healed. And what happens is that this person will start getting themselves prepared for Sunday. Amen. The very people that normally wouldn't show up in church will set Sunday aside. And what happened, people during the week will say, hey, we're going to come over there Sunday because we fish frying. And the person says, you can't come to 12 o'clock. Why? Because I'm going to First Fellowship Charlotte. Why? Because I heard there's a preacher, a man of God, that God works through and works in, and that he has blessed someone, and they were healed. I want to be healed of my high blood pressure. I want to be healed of my diabetes. I want to be healed of what I'm dealing with. I don't want to have to take any more medicine, and so I am going to be there at church. You can come by at 12 when I get back, and what happens, someone hearing that says, well, I... You shouldn't be the only one getting healed. I want to get healed too. In fact, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be my bring my crazy mother-in-law with me too. She drives me crazy. Cause every day I've got to give her a shot. Every day I won't let her eat what she wants to eat. Well, I'm bringing her too. And eventually what happens when we show up next Sunday, there is a line of people waiting down the street. And they ain't here because of a meme. They're here because the gospel spoke to them when they heard it. This is why it's so important for us to open up our mouths and preach the gospel. You ain't got to preach it like I preach it. You ain't got to say it like I said. You, God has done enough in your life to be able to tell the story. Come on now, I need, I need some people that you, 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 weren't, you weren't guaranteed to be here. I need some people who've been through some things. I need some people who've been up against some things. I need some people who have stood at the bottom of the mountain and looked all the way up to the top and said, how in the world am I going to get there? That mountain is rugged. That mountain is jagged. In fact, if you miss a step or a handhold, you're going to fall to your death. Why would God require me to get to the top? up in the mountain, but as you tell your story about how God carved a path for you out climbing the mountain, as you tell your story about how God came down his cloud and lifted you up to the top of the mountain, as you tell your story about how you learned that you are stronger than you ever thought you were because God walked you up, brought you up, brought you to the top of the mountain, someone else sitting at the bottom of their mountain starts saying to themselves, if God did it for her, he'll do it for me. If God did it for him, he'll do it for me. You don't have to worry about advertising the gospel. It will do it itself. Amen. That's our first point. Amen. That we don't have to worry about how we're going to spread the good news. It will do that on its own. Amen. Our second point this morning is our focus shouldn't be ministering to free just a soul. Instead, it should be about freeing as many souls as possible. Our focus shouldn't be about ministering to free just a soul. Instead, it should be about freeing as many souls as possible. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want you to notice something, if you would, in our scripture uh, uh, over the last two Sundays, including today, which should be the third Sunday, if you notice, Jesus did not stop his ministerial activities with the man at the synagogue. I mean, he had the right to come to Simon Peter's house and say, okay, I've preached, I've teached, uh, I've taught, I've preached, I've taught, I've ministered, I'm tired, I need to recover, I need to be replenished, I need to be restored. Where's the fried chicken? Where's the cornbread? Where's the red Kool-Aid? In that order. Amen. Praise God. And you know, we, we could not uh, uh, be angry or mad at God if that is what he decided to do. But notice, as soon as he comes into Simon Peter's house, 
house, someone is walking up on him saying, we have a problem in this house. In fact, the funny thing, Simon Peter never tells Jesus about his problem. His people in the house do. And what does Jesus does? He immediately goes, ministers to her. The brother's tired. The brother's worn out. The brother's depleted. But he, there's still enough God in him that he goes and ministers to her. And we don't know what he did other than taking her hand. We don't know if there was a special trick to it. But whatever he did worked because it healed her and she got up ready to serve. But that here's the knock on the door. Here's the knock. Uh, and he, the door is open to all these people. And it says that Jesus ministered to them all. Amen. Amen. Jesus' focus is all. Amen. And so what he does, he doesn't limit himself, restrict himself to one. Now, let me contrast Jesus with us. Amen. I'm going to quote a scripture here that many of us are going to like because we say it all the time. Heaven rejoices when one person is saved. Amen. We're we, we, we saying amen. Amen. Let me, let me tell you how we misunderstood that. All right. We have misunderstood it because we've assumed that this is a like a news report about what's happening in heaven. It's like as if we sent a news company or a news team up to heaven standing at the outside of the gates and they are recording through the gates and they're saying, oh, there's a party going on in heaven. And, and, they, they, and they catch an angel that's going there and say, what is going on? Well, you know, John Michael on earth, he got saved, so we're partying tonight. Amen. And the news people said, didn't you party last night? Yeah, that was because Susan Anthony got saved. And so the, they're reporting that every time someone gets saved, heaven rejoices and we pat ourselves on the back down here because many times more than likely Susan Anthony and John Michaels even got to know God because one of us shared our witness with them and we think that because we led Susan Anthony or John Michaels to God we have done our duty we have done our uh, Christian, we have fulfilled our Christian obligation that we are good because we led one person to God. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think light on anyone that you've led to God because that was important. But please understand that you are not called just to lead one person. You're called to lead as many as you can. You, when, when God tells us that heaven rejoices when one person is saved, that is not a news report. That is supposed to be encouragement to us. Because if heaven rejoices over one, imagine what heaven does over a whole bunch of folks. Imagine the party, how crazy it is when an entire family gets saved. Imagine how, how, how ruckus things get when a whole community is saved. Imagine how, uh, how wild things things are when a whole city, state, or country is saved. God wants us to go after everyone. And let me give you an idea of how good this party is going to be. You know, every time uh, some sports team wins a sports championship, we see on TV the people in the street all night long basically riding. Riding not because something wrong, but they're celebrating the championship win. Now, amen, I'm not trying to say that the angels get destructive like that in heaven. But what I am saying is that if folks can um, celebrate winning a championship that is only good for two months because in two months the, 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 the season starts over, if they can win and celebrate a championship that's only good for two months, imagine what heaven would do over someone that is saved or a group of people that is saved. We don't even know what a party looks like yet until we get to heaven and experience what it is when someone gets saved. And, 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 and I know you think I'm just pulling that out, making, let me, let me help you, let me point to you where it is in the scripture. The scripture says that they brought everyone to Jesus and then he ministered to them. He exercised demons 
and he exercised, and he healed. He ministered to everyone that was brought to him. In fact, if you look in the scripture, if, if, if you would go to uh, 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 Luke uh, chapter 5, when Jesus first called Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and that gospel, their version, their version has God commanding Peter to go back out on the water. I, amen. So you, you, you didn't get that. Amen. Let me, let me, you, you've been working hard at something all night long. You've been struggling. You've been striving. You've been using your best imagination, your best creative juices, your best inspiration, but nothing you've done has produced a result. There's nothing to show for. There's nothing to, 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 to let the world know that the fruits of your effort, you have nothing. And at the moment that you are getting ready to quit, come on someone, if the moment you were getting ready to quit, that's when Jesus showed up and said, try it again. Amen. Amen. I don't want to get too much into this because this is probably going to be the sermon on August 29th at First, Presbyter First United Presbyterian. You probably want to come up there because you're going to enjoy this sermon. It's, going to, it's called Try Again, but this time try it with Jesus. Amen. Praise God that Jesus says to you, all right, here, why don't you do it again? And when you do it again, it produces such a harvest that you don't have enough space wherever your space is to contain it that you now have to call friends, neighbors, and brothers and sisters to come get some of this harvest and the harvest is still so big and so much that the harvest is trying to kill you. You don't know harvest yet when you put your harvest in a boat and the harvest in your boat causes your boat to sink down into the water. When your life is in danger because you can't get the harvest from the sea to the seashore God is saying that if we would, would change and move our perspective from a one person, a solo perspective to an all perspective, we will watch our harvest grow. We will watch ourselves get persons, catch people for God, so much so we won't even have room enough to do it. It doesn't matter how big we build our buildings. It doesn't matter how much space we put in them. That if we are going to make our focus on catching as many people as God would have us to catch, there will not be a place big enough to hold all the people that God wants to send to us. I know you may be sitting here looking at yourself saying, I don't think that's going to happen because I see a couple of chairs that's empty. I see a whole lot of chairs over there that's not even being used. And it, for God to do that, God has got to do the impossible. But let me remind you of something. Baby, you were the impossible possible. You were just as sinful, as headstrong, as wrong as you wanted to be. In fact, your grandmama and your granddaddy, your mama and your daddy, even your best friend said hell will freeze over before you give yourself to God. And guess what? God sent them all emails talking about bring your coats because it's, it's snowing in hell because God has got you, blessed you, and he has done the impossible in you. He cleaned you up. No longer do you need a drink. No longer do you need a hit. No longer do you need some blow. No longer do you need a shot. No longer do you need your medicine to get right so that you can be who God wants you to be. Now you are living on the spirit. Now you are living in the presence of God and you're living better now than you've ever lived before. And that happens when we trust God to do the impossible. When we let let him use us to minister to others that God will bless us. Amen. Amen. Our, so our first point this morning, amen, is uh, we don't have to worry about how we're going to spread the good news. It will do that on its own. Our second point this morning is our focus shouldn't be ministering to free just a soul. Instead, it should be about freeing as many souls as possible. In our last point this morning, amen, praise God. We cannot allow ourselves to get angry or even upset if not everyone we seek to help acquire freedom from subjugation and oppression doesn't actually become free. We cannot get, allow ourselves to get angry or upset if everyone we seek to help acquire freedom and subjugation, freedom from subjugation and oppression actually becomes free, does not become free. 
Amen. I want to, uh, well, before I say that, y'all know that uh, when I read scripture in preparation of my sermons, one of the things I'm always asking God, reveal something to me that I haven't seen before. And because I've read over this scripture so fast, because it looks like nothing is happening in this scripture, I've missed a point here. And the point is that not everyone that Jesus ministered to that day received the ministry, was healed, was saved, the demons were exercised from. And I know you may be sitting there and like, how did you get that, Pastor Al? Let me walk you through how I got that. Verse 32 starts off with saying, everyone, the people brought everyone in Capernaum to, to Jesus, to where Jesus was staying. That's everyone. That's all. Amen. And the greater, in Charlotte proper, there's about 975,000 people in Charlotte proper. In the greater Charlotte metropolitan area, there's about 2.4 million people. Imagine 2.4 million people coming to your house. That's all, y'all. I mean, we talked about all. But when we get to verse 34, it says many of the people had their sicknesses healed or the demons exercised. Now, I know we live in a world that likes to equate multiple words with, 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 with one meaning, all right? When we say many, many times we mean all. Come on, ask a kid. A ask your child. When your child is about to ask you something, what, what are they going to say? W well, everyone at school, many of my friends... They're really saying at all, everyone, all are doing it except them. Amen. Praise God. Ask many husbands. Amen. Well, well baby, many of my friends' wives, let, let them go to the football game. They, 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 they let them go down to the sports bar to watch the game. That, 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 that many of my friends meet over uh, 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 Terry's house. To play poker on Tuesday nights, we're trying to, what they're really saying is all. But when the gospel, when the scripture says something, something to us, we have to accept it as what it is, not as what we think it is or what we want it to mean. And if it doesn't say something, then we have to accept that too. When this verse 34, when verse 32 talks about everyone, and then verse 32, 4 talks about many, what we're saying is a subset of the larger group something happened to. And in this situation, when he says many of the people that were sick with diseases and illnesses were healed, and many of the people that possessed demons had the demons exercised from them, what they're saying is a subset of the larger group received healing, received deliverance, received freedom. But it's also saying that there's a group that did not. Now, the temptation for us is to assume that the reason why uh, this other group of people did not receive their healing, did not receive their blessing, is because of Jesus' inability to do it. Let's kill that devil from the very beginning. There is no fault in Jesus. There's no shortcoming in Jesus that if those persons that come to Jesus truly want Jesus, they can have Jesus. In fact, we've been talking about it in Bible study. The beauty about God is God does not decide after you do something whether or not he's going to accept it. In fact, God tells you what he will accept from you. And if you do it, it doesn't matter if it takes you 100 years or 100 minutes to do it. He will accept you just the same. And so when we, when we see Jesus here, the issue is not about his ability. It's not about his power. The issue is that someone did not believe in their healing. Someone doubted the exorcisms. Someone questioned Jesus' power. And when they do, when we, in fact, you want to see God not do something for you, question it, doubt it, challenge it. If we really want to see God open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings, you need to be down here with your arms wide open and say, God, pour it on me. I'm ready, God. You can't doubt at all. At all. Because here's the thing. You remember Simon Peter walking on the water? Until he doubted, he walked on the water. 
The more he doubted, the more he sank. I want you to get this. He didn't fall right into the water. His sinking into the water corresponded to the amount of doubt he had. And so the more he doubted, the further down in the water he got. But here's the thing. The instant he believed in Jesus, took Jesus by the hand, Jesus brought him back to the top of the water. I'm trying to help someone understand that not everyone you minister to is going to believe Jesus. That's because they've been through some things. And life has told them if certain things are going to happen, it only can happen this way. And no matter what you say to them, no matter what you do for them, no matter how God blesses you, no matter how God shows up, they still will not believe that it's going to happen and that it will happen. And as a result, it does not happen. And the tendency for most of us, I'm sorry, all of us, is to get upset when someone does not receive respond positively to the word we, we we start questioning god if there's something we did did we say tell the word wrong teach the word wrong did we mistell our witness did we mischaracterize our testimony what was it about us let me help you and let me let you dust yourself off there's nothing wrong with you you didn't teach it wrong you didn't tell it wrong you didn't proclaim it wrong you didn't declare it wrong it's just that the person that you preach to you minister to to, you talked to, was not receptive to it. Jesus talks about the different seed. He says there's seed that fell upon the ground and did not go, in, go into the ground at all. And it was eaten up by the birds. There's seeds that fell into shallow dirt. And what happened? They grew a, a plant, but because their roots had no depth, because they had no anchoring in God, the plants withered. There's some that fell into uh, to ground that had seeds of tears and so what happened the tears and the seed grew up together and the tears as true plants strangled the life out of the of the seed God uh, planted but then there's good soil and a good seed that's planted in good soil that's given all the nurturing and the nutrients and the supported needs that grows into a plant or a vine or a tree or a shrub or a bush that produce a crop 30, 60, 100 times over but I want you to pay attention attention that not all the seed that God planted produced the crop. That means not everything you do is going to produce a harvest. And just because you don't produce a harvest in this season does not mean you lose your mind for next season. In fact, you've got to have what we call a short memory. Amen. This is what professional athletes have to have, a short memory. They can't worry about what they did in last week's game or last night's game. They got to focus on today and maximizing the opportunity today to be to achieve today. And so what you got to do, you got to put out of your mind that the last 10 people that you went to minister to rejected you. That the last 20 people that you sent invitations to to come to church with you did not come. That the last child that you tried to minister to ate your food and never came back. You got to get over that. You've got to say at least I tried. At least I put the effort in and I'm going to keep trying. Because if you give up today the 10 people that God will respond to. The 10 people that will give themselves to God are now forced to go through it longer because you didn't do what you need to do. Therefore, you and I got to stay grounded in God. You and I got to continue to say, yet though he slay me, I will still serve the Lord. Yet though someone will not listen to me, I will still tell my story. Here's the thing about prophets of old. They declared the word of God in season and out of season. They declare the word of God whether people want to hear it or not. You've got to be a prophet like the prophets from the Old Testament. you got to keep telling the world how good God is. you got to keep telling the world how faithful God is. you got to keep telling the world how awesome God is. you got to keep telling the world that God has a power to do anything but fail. you got 
trying to tell the world that all things work to the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You got to keep telling the world that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can think or even imagine according to the power of faith that's within you. You got to tell the world that you can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens you. You got to tell the world, the word, your story, your witnesses, the gospel message. And if you do, if you continue to be steadfast in service, then what will happen? You will see people come to God. You will see people fall at your left and your right asking, what must I do to be saved? You will see people beating you to church. You will see people sitting in your seat when you come into the sanctuary. You will see people chasing after God. And that is what God wants for you to do. That is what God wants for you to, to, to achieve. He wants you to encourage someone else to chase after him. So baby, keep chasing, keep running, keep following, keep pulling, keep praying, keep petitioning, keep requesting, keep pursuing God, chasing after him. And if you do, then you will see a line of people behind you chasing after him too. Okay. Amen. Praise God. Okay. Shabbatabadu. Amen. Praise God. Uh, God is good. Amen. And all the time, God is good. Amen. I don't know about you, uh, but I mean, he's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Amen. Praise God. And I know folks get mad when they, they want to be your number one, but you know, I tell folks, I don't want to be your number one. I want God to be your number one. I'll, I'll happily settle for two. Amen. Because that means if God is your number one, you will always follow and be submitted to him. Amen. Praise God. With that said, next week in our sermon, we're going to look at um, Mark chapter 2. Amen. And those of us who are familiar with Mark chapter 2, that it begins with the story of God healing the paralytic. Uh, the quadriplegic, the guy that is on his mat that his friends bring to him and they have to lure them in um, through the roof. Amen. Praise God. That's where we'll be next week. So I want you to go ahead and read the first 12 verses of chapter 2 of Mark. I want you to get that so in your spirit so that when uh, you come next week, you are able to preach this thing with me. Amen. Amen. I, I just believe if you, if you pray while I preach and we pray, proclaim together, God will be praised. Amen. And so I want you to go ahead and read that. Amen. With that said, let's do this. Let, let me not assume that everyone under the sound of my voice is saved. Amen. Let me not assume that uh, you know uh, G Christ Jesus in the three pardons of your sin. A sins. Amen. Amen. And I know I may not be talking to anyone in here this morning, but I may be talking to someone who's watching us on live stream. Amen. I may be talking to someone who's watching us on YouTube at a later time. And I want you to know that even though uh, you're not here in the sanctuary with me or you're not watching this as we are broadcasting, we still want to lead you to God. And here's the wonderful thing about the, the, the name of Jesus, the power of God. God, it, you don't have to be in the live service to receive God. To receive God, there's only two things you have to do. That is to believe in your heart that he is Lord to the glory of God and confess it with your mouth. That's the requirements. And so in the privacy of your own hearts, I'd like to lead you to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we come to you right now, God, Thanking you, God, for life and life abundantly. Father God, we had no claim to life. We had no right or expectation to experience it. Life is a gift. And God, we thank you for that gift. God, we also want to thank you for another gift you've given us. That's your son, Christ Jesus. For God, you required an offering from us that would atone for the sins we have committed, the sins we are committing, and the sins we will commit. And God, a sacrificial animal, would not do. 
A grain offering would not do. A wave offering would not do. A sin and a guilt offering as, the, as it used to be understood would not do. The only way that you would, could, could this, you, your, your desire for justice, your desire for righteousness would be fulfilled is if you had an offering that was perfect. So, God, you submitted yourself to yourself so that in giving yourself to yourself, this requirement may be fulfilled and your creation, God, may be freed from the stain and the penalty of our sins. Father God, thank you for that person right now who's confessing in his or her heart that are uh, uh, believing in his or her heart that you that your son is Lord to your glory. Thank you, God, for their willingness to confess it out loud. And God, we pray right now that these persons would realize that once they believed and have made the confession, they are saved. They are now new creatures in Christ. The old has passed away and they have become new. Then God, we want you to walk with them for the remainder of their lives. We want you to minister to them. We want you to guide them, lead them, feed them, protect them, provide for them, ed educate, edify, empower, equip, enable. Do whatever you need to do in them so that, God, everything they do brings you glory. When they walk, it brings you glory. When they talk, it brings you glory. God, when they help or minister or assist, it brings you glory. And, Father God, when it's said and done, well, they, these persons have served you throughout their lives, and their life is over. We pray that you would personally come down here, get them, and take them back to heaven to be with you forever. Father God, that's your promise. That's your word, and God, we believe it. Now, God, allow someone to walk in the newness, walk in the freedom, walk in the uh, love and forgiveness that you have in store for them. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, that is what we call a sinner's prayer. Amen. If you have and you've accepted Christ for the very first time today, I want you to either send me a private message to my Facebook profile, Al Kennan, or my email, PastorAlKennan the third at gmail.com. It's on the screen. Send that to send that message to me and we'll begin walking together. I've said it before, and I'll keep saying it too. Uh, I've run out of breath. We do not birth babies in the natural and set them in the corner and say, raise yourself, baby. We nurture them. We care for them. We feed them. We clothe them. We shelter them. We do everything we need to do so that they can grow into self-sustaining, self-sufficient adults. Same thing. God does not birth babies for us to sit them in the corner and to have them uh, uh, raise themselves. We nurture you. We encourage you. We feed you. We protect you. We provide for you until you can become a self-sustaining, self-sufficient servant of God. Amen. Contact me. Don't, you don't have to do this alone. Contact me. I'm telling you to contact me. It's okay. Amen. Praise God. Let me uh, remind us a couple reminders. Amen. Remember the 29th, we will not have service here. That's not next weekend. It's the weekend after. We uh, will be at First United Presbyterian Ch uh, Church. I have emailed pretty much everyone. I need to get the email to you, you guys. But I've emailed everyone. Now I've emailed you three times. Same email. Uh, amen. And I'll email you next week and then right before the 29th. But let's be mindful. Put it in your mental Rolodex. Put it on your calendar. Uh, we will be at First United Presbyterian Church on the 29th at 11 o'clock. Amen. A.M. Amen. Praise God. Also, uh, please don't forget if you have your uh, your, your, your tithes and offering, you haven't dropped them in the box yet. The box is out here in the vest of you. It looks like a little miniature church. Just drop your tithes and offerings in there. If you're online or you want to do electronically, uh, follow the link uh, for, for Gibbify. If you're a church member, I've sent you that link in an email last night. Just click the link. It'll take you there. If you are online, just go to uh, our, uh, amen, go to our uh, church Facebook page, and there's, a, there's several links for it there. Amen? Amen. With that said, if all hearts and mind are of one accord, let us go ahead and, and have our benediction and get busy enjoying this day that the Lord has made. With all heads bowed, dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, 
we thank you this day for because God, this is a day you have made. We are rejoicing. We are glad in it. Father God, we pray right now that God, as we leave this place, we never leave your presence. That as we go out here this week, that you will keep us mindful of the things you have shared with us today. So that God, we may cast our nets wide and long and catch everyone that you would have us to catch. Now, Father God, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you, God, for loving us as you have. And now use us, God, to your glory. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. Please have a blessed day. Amen.